Hello, my name is Robert Morgan. Let me just bring this back to life. My name is Robert Morgan. I am a uh, game writer and narrative designer, whatever that is. And I'm here to talk a bit about VR and a bit about augmented reality. First of all, can anyone name this film? What film is this from? Shout it out. Dr. No, excellent, thank you very much. Dr. No, this is a noted example of rear projection, or what we would now call green screen. It's a really famous early example of a technology that at the time was very new. Now, obviously to us this looks a touch silly, especially if I just go back, I mean, just look at that car. It looks a bit ridiculous, but also, there's a formal problem with this scene. It's not just that we have been able to improve on these graphics since this film came out. The formal problem is that it's structured like a chase. Bond keeps looking in the mirror. He keeps looking behind him. We keep being invited to look behind him because it's a chase. Because of the way the scene is constructed, we're invited to see all the cracks, all the flaws in the scene. Now, of course, this technology has massively improved since then. This is from that great Gatsby film that was on a while ago. But what I want to try and persuade you of tonight is that the formal setup, the emotional setup, the emotional weight of a scene has at least as much, if not more, to do with how convincing the scene is and how distracting the visual problems with the scene are compared to the visuals. Because after all, let's not forget, when Tarantino decided to put a rear projection effect in Pulp Fiction, because why not, he's Quentin Tarantino, it was a nice little gimmick, it was a fun little moment, but it wasn't distracting, it didn't take our attention away from the emotional weight of the scene, because it was well written, it was well shot, it was emotionally interesting, and so we stopped paying attention to this crappy graphic at the back. It didn't cause us a problem for immersion. And for me, that's a real thing when we're considering VR, because for now, right now and for a little while longer, we need to be able to create compelling VR experiences which are compelling on their own emotional merits, not just because they're incredibly convincing, because we aren't quite there yet in terms of being able to convince people that we're putting them somewhere completely new with VR. That is the potential of it, but we're not quite there yet. And so in creating really new emotional effects, for me as a writer, I need to, and I need to try and talk you into this evening, the idea that by using the new formal capacities of the VR medium, we can create all new emotional effects that are just as exciting as the all new visual effects that we can achieve. Now, what's at stake here? Well, probably everybody here is familiar with something called the Uncanny Valley. Up to a point when things look things that are man-made look human, they're kind of cutesy and interesting. But then after a certain point, if you try and make them look too human and don't get it right, then they start becoming uncanny, it makes us uncomfortable. And then theoretically, there's a point beyond this where an artificial human can be convincing and doesn't make you feel really weird. Right now in VR, the problem is that we're having to fill the uncanny valley with money in order to get over it. Because creating realistic experiences, and especially realistic people, is a really exciting expensive business. And what I want to try and talk you into this evening is that you can make up for almost all of this gap with really easy, easy-ish, otherwise I'd be putting myself out of a job, dialogue with emotional effects by thinking about the emotional predicament, the emotional situation that you're creating in your VR experience, for example, or in your game experience generally. Because my whole thing is emotional immersion, which of course holds just as good for video games and is why the video games that stand out for us, which try and tell you a story, are in some ways more memorable than games which tell you a poor story. Now, I have no problem with games which don't bother with a story at all, because that's fine. They, 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 they don't email me about them, but I'm just as big a fan of those games as anyway. So just today, I'm just talking about story games. Now, visual fidelity, really spectacular visual effect, is going to be one way that we get bums on seats in VR, or rather eyeballs in sockets, eyeballs in headsets. But as we move past that tech demo stage, we're going to have to create emotional immersion. Now, I'm going to give you an example. Bums on seats. We found out the other day that it seems that Sony is now strongly recommending to PSVR, PlayStation VR developers, they create seated experiences. Now this means that they create experiences which are designed to be experienced while you're sitting down, rather than standing up. Because this is a big question in the VR community. What effect does it have on immersion if the character that you're playing is supposed to be standing, but you are sitting? What effect does this have on how immersed you feel in the experience? Well, the thing is, people ask me, are we gonna have to sell different chairs for each 
VR experience so that you're sitting in the right kind of chair. And honestly, I just don't think this matters that much. And I'll give you an example why. Because at this point in the evening, you're probably all starting to get a bit uncomfortable. Your bum's gone slightly numb. Yes, heads are nodding. That's because that's that stage of the evening. But if I hadn't mentioned it, that would just take place at the back of your brain. You wouldn't be thinking about it too much because, of course, what's happening on stage is so fascinating. But also because the human brain is really, really good at acknowledging and then ignoring physical phenomena and sensory phenomena. However, emotional phenomena, and particularly social phenomena, we're much less good at ignoring. So if, for example, you were to look at the person sitting opposite you or sitting next to you and give them a wink, suddenly, the awkward factor, the uncomfortable factor, is way more significant than any amount of slightly uncomfortable bum cheek numbness could create. And that's because immersion is an emotional issue. Humans are bundles of emotions. Humans are bundles of feelings, and we are also collections of feelings which are constantly interacting with one another. Immersion is an emotional issue, and I don't just mean because it causes really intense arguments on Reddit. Immersion is a social issue, and I don't just mean because Facebook now own Oculus. What I mean is that whether the star of your VR experience is a human, or whether they're a hedgehog, it's that human experience in VR which will help us get over immersion, get o uh, create immersion, and get over the, what will continue to be for some time the visual, the formal problems of VR. In terms of creating the sense that you are there, I believe it's way more powerful to make players want to be there, to create what in theater is still called suspension of disbelief. People are really good at this. They're very willing to do it, but try and tricking their eyes into making them feel that they're in a certain place, but then not providing an emotional connection with someone when they're there, or an unrealistic emotional effect when they're there, will snap people out of immersion just as quickly as, you know, as a texture popping out, or just as quickly as a visual glitch. And all of this means that immersion is a narrative issue, which puts it in my wheelhouse. Or to put it a final and very kind of self-serving way, immersion is a story issue. Now, what does this actually mean, since I've made you uncomfortable in your seats already, which is kind of a risky gambit for that stage of the talk? Well, in order to talk about what this actually means in my experience working in VR games, I want to talk about three things which I think will help raise your VR experience, but which are also applicable to standard games, and hopefully I'll show at the end, sort of applicable in interesting new ways to augmented reality. So we'll get to that sometime in the future. And of course, in the effort to try and give you three examples of how to grab your VR users by the eyeballs, I thought that in order to make sure it's really relevant, I'd do it in the dominant medium of our times, the listicle. Now, effect number one. If you've developed or you've ported a title to VR that has human NPCs in it, then you'll know that the first thing that your VR user does, and in fact, that any new first-time VR user, the first thing that they do is that if they find a character, human NPC, they get right up in their grill. They go and stand right next to them. They go and test out the social space surrounding that NPC, a human or a hedgehog because humans are social creatures. We're packets of social information, and we're also like we're, we're bundles of social rules. When you put a first-time VR user into a virtual reality experience that has a human in it, or something that acts human, or something that looks human, just like a scarecrow, we always go up and we want to test to see whether it's human, which means we watch it, which means we get a bit closer to find out if it acts like a human. And the easiest way to find out is to get a little bit too close, or to start making a little bit too much eye contact. Sorry, mate. That's because they want to try it out. If our VR users are looking at something that looks human, they want to find out whether it is or not. And the way we find out as humans, just like when we're babies, is to work out if there's social rules surrounding that person. Getting close is important, not just because in games, our standard gamer, someone who's used to 2D, not 2D, but someone who's used to games of all kinds, is used to the idea that proximity is an affordance because it's often how we activate characters. 
if you have a character that you want to activate, rather than just shoot, that is. The proximity is really important in VR because that's where the cracks start to show. Now, Matt Burdett of the Oculus Story Studio calls this something slightly different. He calls it the Swayze effect, Spe specifically referring to the movie Ghost, because it's about what they found when they were creating Oculus Rift experiences, which had people in them, that the people kind of ignored the user, either because the user wasn't embodied and the user was just a camera floating around the scene trying to take it all in. No matter what way the player existed in the experience, if there are people nearby you and they're ignoring you, they appear to be unable to respond to you, it creates a really weird dislocating feeling, just like Patrick Swayze in Ghost, who, because he's dead, spends the entire movie shouting at people on the street, saying, I'm here, I'm here, and no one will acknowledge him. And it's a very uncomfortable thing to watch, and it's a very uncomfortable thing to experience. And VR can create this experience very easily if you have somebody who simply ignores you. A, because of course in games we're very unused to being ignored. In games we're very used to being the center of attention and the reason that everything exists. But also B, because it's just uncomfortable to be sitting screaming in an environment full of people who refuse to look at you. If you've ever been a particularly cool, cruel uh, child, you'll definitely know that because there's a great game you can play where you pretend that your younger brother doesn't exist for upwards of two weeks. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> the point is, this came up for Matt Burdett from Oculus Story Studio because they had a demo called Henry, which was about a lonely hedgehog who was on his own on his birthday. It was a really interesting environment. They had created a really lush place for you to look around. It was a great character. It was animated really, really well. The problem was that they created, almost at the last minute, they decided to add an immersive effect to this demo by making Henry look at you. He made eye contact with you, the VR camera. So he would occasionally, while he was putting the cake out, he would kind of, he would look at you and sort of grin. And it was an interesting effect. And the, the effect of eye contact was really significant in VR. The problem was the story of the demo was that he was alone on his birthday and was really lonely. And that's what the punchline of the demo was. So it created a dissonance within the demo because, of course, it's not about being ignored. Now, how do we get past this? Well, the good news is that talk is cheap. And dialogue is how we mediate awkward situations as humans anyway. And so in fact, dialogue can make up for a range of ills because we're still going to have NPCs who don't react in exactly the way a human would react. We're not going to have that for a very long time. But fortunately, dialogue can make up for a lot of the gap a lot of the human gap, a lot of the uncanny gap between your NPCs and the player, and still make the player feel like they're being responded to, like they're in a real environment, and let that the people that they're speaking to are surprisingly real. And how do you do this? Well, it's through easy wins. Because I've been working in VR for a little while, and I can tell you that there are some easy wins in there. Eye contact is a really easy win. If you expect, if you plan for your player getting right up in the grill of any NPC that they meet, or at least the first NPC that they meet, if you write just a couple of dialogue lines for that person to say, wow, this is getting weird. Why are you looking at me like that? It's tiresome to do that over and over again. But all we have to do is train our VR users to expect these people to act like humans. And after a while, they'll stop breaking the rules because they understand them. But that first few experiences where they make too much eye contact, or if you've played as much VR or worked on as many VR projects as I have, you'll notice a pattern where if there's a human NPC, then players often sneak around the back and start looking at their bum. A theme emerges, I'm sorry. Now, that's because it's a really, really quick way of finding out if somebody is a real human. They look like a human, but are there any social rules attached to their behavior? And so by combining this low-hanging fruit, these easy wins, by creating dialogue, which anticipates the scenario where we spend too much time doing eye contact, or we sneak around and look at their ass, and you know, those are just two examples, and similar situations where you create a dialogue reason to teach the, your user that this person is real, it has a massive effect. Because of course, it's going to be a very long time before we have convincing 
physical feedback, haptic feedback. When you bump into somebody, people are working on body suits which will use electrical induction to create the feeling that you've bumped into someone, even if that person is virtual. But if you bump into someone in a virtual environment and that person says, oi, that does 99% of the emotional work that physical feedback does. Because that's what humans log. That's what we record. That's why you've already forgotten that your bum's gone numb, but you're probably still a little bit nervous about that person that you winked at earlier on. So that's number one. Number two, let your users identify. What happens when your VR user looks down and doesn't see what they expect, either because the physical manifestation of the user is different or because they're wearing different shoes? Now, personally, I don't think this is that much of a problem either because players are really good at role-playing. They're much better than we give them credit for. And if you give them the tools, they can be and become and immerse themselves in all kinds of surprising people. Let's take Adam Jensen as an example from the first Deus Ex reboot. He's a fairly conventional game hero. Now, most conventional studio wisdom would say that players shouldn't have much trouble playing him because he's got brown hair and he's got a dead girlfriend and he's uh, gruff. They played people like him before, but there are, the game gives us ways of getting to know Adam, which aren't just about being told about him. This is an example from his bedroom. It, the, well, the ensuite bathroom in his bedroom. If you go into his bathroom, Adam Jensen's own flat, you're seeing through this character's eyes. You see that there's a punch mark in the middle of the mirror. And there's a sign that says, oh, I've got to go and order another mirror. If you go and hack into your landlord's computer, then you find out that the other mirror, the replacement mirror, has arrived, but they're keeping it from you and telling you that it hasn't arrived yet because they're so pissed off with you because it turns out that you've broken five mirrors in the last two weeks because you've undergone this Frankensteinian experience. It's a way of telling us that the character whose eyes we're seeing through hates the sight of himself. We find out something about the character without ever leaving their vision without ever stopping seeing through their eyes. You can use the same sort of weird trick to immerse players in characters who they might not expect to play. So Shell is the protagonist of Portal and Portal 2. But the experience of actually figuring out how to see yourself is associated with solving a puzzle because you're not on the box. Shell is not on the box of the game. And you can't see yourself other than by figuring out a way to place the portals so that you can see through the portals and see yourself. At which point you're already invested because you've been playing the game for a decent amount of time before you can figure out how to do this. And so you, when you find out who you're playing, it doesn't make much of a difference to you because it's just new physical information, but you're seeing through that person's eyes the whole time. Now the third point is just to dial it back a little bit. And this is rich coming from me, Mr. Dialogue, but I found time and time again that less is even more with VR. So this was an experience where I worked on, I wrote the dialogue for the initial announcement demo for the Morpheus, which is the Shark Tank demo called The Deep. We had a sort of a person speaking to you about what happened, and what happens is that a shark starts attacking you when you're part way down through this sort of shark cage experience. Something goes badly wrong. Somebody sort of narrated this experience to you, because my first instinct was to write the dialogue where this person was screaming and supporting your horror and making you feel more horrified. But in the end, that just ended up sounding really, really redundant. Because you don't need that information because it's happening to you. And the more we pulled back and wrote less dialogue, the more it became an interesting experience, because actually the person on the other end of the headset ended up not knowing what was happening to you at all. And so they were quietly keep trying to keep you calm because something's gone wrong with the cage. We'll get you out of there in a minute. Meanwhile, a shark's beating itself against the front of the cage. So it was a juxtaposed position, which actually made it more horrified because you knew that help wasn't coming. So what does this mean? Narrative, immersion is a narrative issue. The thing is, from my perspective, people have been able to create immersion using nothing more than words for thousands of years. So although we have more immersive tools at our disposal, I still think that the words, the dialogue, the emotional predicament that you create with your VR experience is still gonna be the biggest thing in getting people really engaged in it. And what's at stake here is if, the, if we can't create emotionally engaging VR experiences, then putting the headset on is gonna be no more immersive than this. That's why story is going to be key to VR, and that's why I want to very quickly wrap up by talking a little bit about augmented reality. Because people, particularly people who haven't tried VR yet, ask me all the time about whether 
these kids playing this VR stuff are going to get lost in virtual environments, are going to get lost in a world that they can't tell the difference between this world or that world, or that's better. But for me, we've been able to do that for thousands of years. That's been happening to people for thousands of years. Reading too many Gothic novels caused people to go out and do crazy things in the Victorian era. That's what Don Quixote is about. He reads too much nightly stories. He gets immersed in the story. He gets immersed in a virtuality of his own making. Imagination is just as important in this stuff. So what happens when we apply these same principles to augmented reality? Number one, get up in their grill. In augmented reality, if VR beams straight into your skull, augmented reality beams straight into your life. That's how I think, that's how I think I know that it's going to be a new paradigm that may be even more significant in its way than VR. Because, of course, phones were the dominant new paradigm of the last, de uh, the last decade. They changed games the most rather than an increase in resolution because they created a way for games to fit around our lives rather than to be an entertainment cave that we just went into and experienced some entertainment and then had to come out again and go into the real world. Whereas augmented reality can integrate with our lives. Number two, let them identify. What does this mean in augmented reality? Well, augmented reality, in its apotheosis, in its fullest form, is going to allow us to customize our own perspective on the world, to create our own HUD, heads-up display, through which we experience the world, whether that's nice little tools that allow us to see someone's name hovering above their head so we never have to remember their name, which is going to be incredibly useful for me but also to customize how they see themselves or how you yourself are displayed to other people and not just in a creepy Fallout 4 way. In all its many forms, augmented reality, because there are many forms for augmented reality. I'm not just talking about Google Glass. I'm talking about audio. I'm talking about uh, information on a headset, because after all, we already augment our reality when we use a phone walking down the street, which displays where we are and displays a map and displays where we're going to. It's like a layer that's laid over reality that gives us more information about our reality. And whether that's visually or whether it's how an ingress player, if there are any ingress players in the house, they see the world differently because of the way the game works. And they see real artifacts in the world, like a landmark, as potential battlegrounds because they have a digital context. They have a different layer. They experience an additional layer of the world to other people. Similarly, the upcoming Pokemon Go will allow a Pokemon Go player to view an opportunity to go to the beach as, in part, an opportunity to go and get a new rare... I don't know. I, I, I haven't played Pokemon for like over a decade. But I was going to say Charizard, which would date me horribly. Now... Lastly, what does it mean in augmented reality to give the player some space? Well, for me, augmented reality allows you to create experiences where 90% of what goes on takes place in the player's mind. And that's nothing new, because almost all stories are really just supporting the player's imagination. Augmented reality is going to give us an opportunity to have monsters not just in the TV that you can go and fight, but monsters in your own neighborhood that you can go and fight, or befriend if you choose. Because if 90% of our new stories told in augmented reality take place in the player's mind, then that means the most important affordance is imagination. And luckily for us, that doesn't have to go into the budget. That's where I want to leave it. Thank you very much. Thank you to Matt Burdett. And thank you to whiteguyswearinoculusrifts.tumblr.com for the image sources.